Hello and welcome to Thomas Talks, a new series of relaxed conversations, but hopefully revealing, where we meet face to face and discuss pertinent issues around human matters with leading academics and practitioners from the world of occupational psychology. I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor Adrian Furnham, a leading academic. Um, a very prolific author, Adrian, you'll have to let us know exactly how many mm -hmm. later on, mm -hmm. and a much-in-demand consultant in the world of occupational psychology, working indeed all over the world. So first of all, Adrian, hello, welcome and thank you for thank joining you me today. Thank you great pleasure. Adrian, today's topic is succession planning. Mm. Not a term I particularly like, but perhaps more of that later on. Mm. But I was thinking, before we launch into the, the practicality of succession planning, is it worth really examining the changing nature and face of leadership at the moment? I think it is. I think it's more and more difficult to become a leader. I think you know the many shareholders in a company have got more demands than ever. Most leaders have to appear on the media the whole time. They are uh, uh, accessible more than ever before. They've got to be politically very savvy. They also f say they have more demands from their staff. They want you know, their leaders to be uh, more approachable, more emotionally intelligent. Um, these uh, technology changes uh, tremendously, the economic environment. To be a successful leader now is more difficult than ever, in my view. No, I'd agree. I, th I think that's really interesting, that you have to be this multifaceted person. Mm. I think that uh, one of the interesting points you made there is, is the changing nature of the staff. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not that old, but I remember, I in a way, being delighted to have a job when, when I first got employed, whereas now it feels like we are being interviewed by potential employees to see if we are the right employer for them and I think part of that is the the emotional mix the the ability to intuit if you like your, your position in society and I think that's really changing. Yes I mean in the old days you used to think well the chap went to a good university he'll be fine he's usually probably bright enough and it's important to know that the leaders are bright enough and I stress the word enough but of course there's emotional intelligence as well as intelligence and people will say that you know once you've got to a certain level of ability and you can do the job it's your ability to engage your staff it's your ability to persuade your your uh, uh, competitors it's your ability to charm your uh, customers of one sort, sort or another and those are really important aspects to all forms of leadership i think most people accept the fact that you need both iq and eq in other words you need to be bright bright enough and you need to have emotional intelligence. Now, there's always the question of which do you need more of? And I have to say, I come down on the side of IQ is more important than EQ. I would have to, well, I'd have to disagree, I think, Asian. Right. Not that it's an either or, mm -hmm. but I think one needs to be tempered by the other. I think you absolutely need enough IQ, but I think a, an absence of EQ you don't have the engagement, you don't have that cultural yeah. fit, you won't bring the people along with you. I would rather have a cold, not very empathic, very clever boss than a warm, kind, appreciative, dim boss. <laughs> You're going to extremes. I am. You're going to extremes. I am. I think there's a minimum level of IQ yes. but it has to be tempered with, yes. it, with some EQ. Yes. I think the absolute absence of EQ, I, don't, I think you might have an effective company, I think you'd have terribly high chance. I think that's fair. I think that's fair, dudes. But people have said for a long time, EQ is more important than IQ, and no. I think they're wrong. No, I think I, you I need minimum you. levels of yeah. both, uh, well, uh, optimal levels of both, and you need to know how to measure them. Both are really important. I agree. I do disagree about the fact that you would, you would, you would work in a company for a long period of time, but by an IQ-only led boss, I think that would be a fairly <laughs> horrific place. I think it's that authentic leadership. I think people still want the the strategic vision, I think they want the decisive decision making, but they also want some of these um, more humanistic skills. I think that the, the mm. idea of not knowing everything, of being much more vulnerable and being prepared to, to share that with staff and, and revealing that nature of your character, because I think that creates that greater bond, that engagement, which, is, yes. which a lot of companies view as increasingly important to, to generate success. I think they're absolutely right. I mean, there used to be the time when, you know, the boss lived in a, the top of the building and was protected by the PA, and you, you were lucky if you saw him maybe at a Christmas party or something. <laughs> and now one is expected to walk around, do a bit of MBWA, management by walking about, absolutely. and engaging with the staff. Staff wanted, staff expected, and staff should be able to expect that you want your leader to be approachable, to be sophisticated, to be trustworthy, to have integrity. All these are things that we've always wanted, but they're much more in demand now than ever before. So when, you're, when you have that in mm. place, 
and so you have these these competencies you have this emotional intelligence you you have the vision and you have this um humanistic skills and they depart whether a planned departure or an unplanned departure organizations i mean what steps should they be taking in order to to make sure they're they're getting the right person mm. to mm. to step up to the next role because yeah. is it as you say it, it can no longer just be a measure really of of, of academic yeah. ability or possibly even practical experience it, it is a much wider book are, are there ways and means where, where you can well, test for this uh, yes I think there's no doubt about it. I mean you start off with trying to be very specific about what you want has the role changed is the uh, job going to be slightly different in the future if so what are the characteristics you want? Now, I think with all leadership, there are certain characters everybody wants. You need to be bright enough. You need emotional intelligence. You need a bit of competitiveness, a bit of courageousness. You need emotional stability. And what one can do is one can say, these are the characteristics we want. Maybe these are the characters we don't want. And you could look for a series of measures that will help give you a very good insight into um, those characteristics. Do people have enough of or sufficient or too much of a certain characteristic which relates to uh, leadership abilities. I don't think testing in itself is enough, but I can't imagine how people will make serious decisions without using some tests to give them a good background indication of what to investigate further. No, I think that's quite valid. We, we oh, look, we are an assessment company. I mean, we, they are part of our, our warp mm. and weft, and, and so I think that we have an enormous amount of insight into our own people. We, we measure... You know, speed of cognition through using something like GIA. We use one of your own tools, indeed, mm. at HPTI, to measure the, mm. the high potential, especially some of the interesting traits you were talking about then mm. in terms of um, conscientiousness. Mm. You know, but tempering that, you know, I want enough conscientiousness to make sure someone's going to get the job done, mm. but actually not too much. I mean, mm. excessive conscientiousness could mean that nothing ever gets out the door. Mm. You're always trying to perfect it. And I think having some of these measures enables you to make better informed decision making as part of that process or part of that yes, evaluation. Yes, absolutely. What you want is you want some way of getting a handle on the individual. You might want to investigate them further afterwards. But I can't imagine how you could make a serious decision about an individual in a selection situation, even a coaching situation, without using some instruments which give you an indication of the sort of people they are and the sort of things you need to follow up. I mean, if you take conscientiousness as an example, the, the work ethic, prudence, reliability, whatever you want to call it. Indeed, this morning I had breakfast with, with somebody who's having potential problems, and her issue is around conscientiousness, that she's OCD, she's a perfectionist, and she can't let things go. And this is giving her problems and her staff problems. Yeah. And because she's very conscious, she's too conscientious. So one of the things I think many uh, selectors never think about is this idea of having too much of a good thing. Derailers, potentially, I think. Potential yeah. derailers, yeah. And so this is another interesting area, I think, with the succession planning, is looking for things that you don't want or looking for things in extremeness. Because if people are very, very anything, if they're very, very resilient, it might be they're too cold, it might be that they're too unempathic, or if they're very, very, uh, you know, risk-taking would be an interesting one. You don't want people to be highly, extremely risk-takers, nor the opposite. So you want this concept of optimality. And, of course, the test will give you an indication of this. Well, the great thing about that, of course, it makes it defensible decision-making. Because, of course, in today's litigious climate, or indeed in, in the workplace of, of, of a boardroom, when you have a number of people, all of whom are adept, all of whom are obviously have competencies, they wouldn't have risen that high, but they're competing against each other for potentially the number one slot, you have to be able to have some academic rigour in, in defending your decision-making process. Indeed, that's the case. I mean, I think we've inherited this from the Americans, who are particularly litigious, but the idea is that we have information clear, objective information on which we based our decisions, rather than being accused of some old boy network or some sort of favouritism, indeed. Yeah, well, your point. golf handicap. <laughs> exactly. That'll usually suffice. Um, we're talking really about, about that uh, immediate selection process. If I was to wind it back and say, the actual whole process of planning for succession, I mean, is this something which, which in your opinion, I mean, I know you've consulted to a huge amount of organisations mm. around the world, where do you think it should start? When do you think it should start? Is it identifying potential right the way from recruitment? Is it giving people tasks and, and, and identifying potential high flyers and stretch them throughout their career with the business? Mm. What would you suggest would be would be good practice? I think what 
in the old days, you used to do uh, succession management was usually based on trying to fulfil particular roles. And what people say these days is there's too much change about. In other words, this job which we have now will be quite significantly different in a few years' time. And to find people to replace individuals in top roles for the same sort of job doesn't seem to be as important any longer because of the change factor. So what people are doing, as you said, was looking for people with what one might call talent, who were able to take up a number of different roles, which are good for them and good for the organisation. And that is why so many you know, HR departments now call themselves talent management Absolutely. departments. That's what they see yeah. themselves as doing. Well, I, I mean, I'm with you. I think it's probably more talent planning yeah. rather than succession planning. Succession yes. has this sense of anointing the next king. Yes. And I think talent really is saying that there's a talent pool. How do we identify it, nurture it, develop it, put it into different ways? I've noticed even in our own business, um, we have, which I'm delighted by, we have a, a really fantastic intake of young new staff, very talented, very able, very impatient. You know, six months in, they're sort of saying, well, I'm ready for my next challenge. Yes. What can you do? And I think that sense of you used to have to serve your almost apprenticeship in a particular role is going. And I think that really you can start to assess people and their potential for the future, in, in my eyes, far earlier now in their career, because you can with this demand to keep changing role or adapting role, you can then start to assess them on a far broader range of skills and capabilities than I think that in before. But it does put a challenge on the organisation. I think uh, the organisation needs to be far more agile. Yes, absolutely. I mean, what used to be the case was that you say to people, uh, I think these are the talented individuals, and the talented individuals said, well, if we're talented, what are you going to do to us? How are you going to help us? realise that potential. And, and you if know, you didn't identify people, you've got the other pool who are not talented who are probably going to leave. Very unhappy. So, you know, I mean, that yeah. doesn't really work out. If you, yeah. if, you, if you kind of identify people into two camps, one camp is definitely going to be unhappy. I'm Absolutely. Sure. But the interesting thing about the, the talent group is that they have expectations yeah. about having their talents developed. And if you've got an organisation which simply identifies talent and it calls them the talent group and does nothing to them or for them, they're going to leave quite quickly. So Agreed. in that sense, you know, it, they seem d more demanding than they ever have been in the past. And yet, if you put money into them, if you put effort into them, yeah. you'll be rewarded. You know, someone said the other day, I, a fascinating comment, which, which said, uh, someone said, why should we put money, why should we develop the talent group when they're going to leave? And he said in response, well, why, what would happen if you didn't put money into the talent group and they stayed? Yeah. In other words, you've got, to, you've got to put effort into identifying, nurturing and developing people who can take these senior roles in the future. And if you don't, you're going to have huge churn. I mean, I think that there's such an expectation on developing. I know from, from ourselves, we, we look at stretch projects, we offer people the opportunity to go and support our increasing international network. And they might not have um, an appreciation of the nuances of the local culture, but they have some skills and knowledge from, from head office. And it is that stretching, it's that broadening of expectation yes. and experience. Yes. It's that sharing of knowledge around the world. And I think it, it, it's, they come back broader people with, with, with I think, a greater world view, which, which they then bring back to, yes. to the central business that works well. Well, I, t I tell you what I do with some of them. I say to them, look, you know yourself better than I do. Imagine I'm going to give you three months off and I'm going to give you 20 grand for this assignment how would you choose to spend it? In other words, what would you like to do? And, of course, one of the indicators of talent is self-awareness, and they have a self-awareness about how they can develop their talents further. So it's not a cheap business necessarily, but it's an essential one. And it'll be interesting to see what they come back with, whether they're looking at training, whether they're looking at coaching, yes. joining formal leadership programs. Yes. I mean, all of these things are, are available and there. Yes. And it's quite interesting to see who opts for what or, or, or what combinations, because yes. it's, I think that... You're right. If it's everything's driven by the organisation centrally and there's no opting in by the person, I always feel that people will do better when they make their own choices as opposed to having choice thrust upon them. Yes. I've, you know, people that working, uh, building houses in Africa. One of my friends crewed, didn't crew, he was part of a crew of going around Cape Horn on a yacht. And he said that three months changed his life forever because you really know about teamwork and interdependence and fear and how to cope with fear. And he said that experience was better than an MBA, better than anything he can imagine. And it's made him more insightful, more empathic, more resilient, etc. I think that's a, a, an interesting way to lead into, again, a, about when you're talking about IQ, is how much can be trained and how much can be mm. learned. We tend to think about the development of executives in a few ways. We, I know we've discussed already some stretch projects. There are formal training and, and how people choose that mix. There seems to be an increasing trend, especially at the C-suite level, for executive coaching. Mm. Um, 
what are your thoughts on that? I've, I've heard you expound on this in in, in other yes. in other venues, and, yes. I, and, and, you, I, and you seem to have some interesting observations. I am which are a skeptic. A little bit counterculture. Yeah, a little bit counterculture. I think you know many organisations. Uh, C-suite people have a coach, and they're very proud to have a coach. And it's a sign of them being very very senior. My question is: Does coaching work? Is is it? Does a coach help you? And what do they do? And I have to say, um, I'm a bit of a sceptic. I have seen uh, the very occasional uh, executive benefit from coaching, but I've also seen a lot of money wasted on, on coaching. The assumption is that anyone can be a coach or, or it's very easy to find a coach. I think there are better methods. You know, I'm stretch assignments, these sort of things, I think personally are better because it's so difficult to find coaches who can deliver. I think that is my point that I think that good coaching works yeah but there's too much mediocre coaching out there yeah there is at the c-suite level I think that it is a fairly lonely place you have to have high levels of self-awareness and you have to have a certain reflective personality yes. in order to be able to really rigorously self-critique yourself yes as we said earlier on you know IQ without EQ I think possibly does require some coaching to help reflect back decision making and make one question oneself. And, but you need a good coach to do that, and then you can see the benefit. You need a good coach, but you need one who's right for you. And then there's a problem of coach dependency. You know, you, you're quite right. In the C-suite, it's lonely up there. You need someone to talk to, someone to confess to. You know, and I say there are C words: Are you a coach, or are you a confessor, or you're a counselor? What are you? And of course, you're all these things. But the worry is the addiction sometimes to coaches, that you'll see executives becoming coach dependent. And that also worries me, that they might have been very good at initially, they might have done a very good job helping you, but then you become dependent on them. And that can't be good for either the coach or the executive. That well, sounds like a transition from a coach to becoming a therapist. Possibly not a good thing in business. Indeed. And where do you think culture fits in and cultural fit? I have a tendency that... that that I tend to talk about culture a lot. I, I think that we put organisations together, both you know, for international organisations and for distributors, we brought them back into the fold. You have different cultures, different approaches, but I do think that you need a certain amount of homo homogeneity? <laughs> homogeneity. <laughs> homogeneity in order to, <laughs> to kind of affect that, that standard approach towards being what you want to be. And I think that culture is often overlooked. And how would you think it plays a role in ensuring that your executive choice is the right choice for the business? Well, there's a difference between national culture and corporate culture. So sometimes you can work for an organisation which has a very strong corporate culture, which reflects a national culture. So thinking of some of the banks I work for, and I won't mention names, but one can guess, yeah. but there's this very strong corporate culture which reflects the national culture. And it's a very strong culture, meaning you adapt to the culture or else. And you yeah. go to their offices around the world, and they're the same everywhere. They are homogeneous. Yeah. That can have good signs to it because it's like going to McDonald's. It's the same everywhere and it's very familiar. On the other hand, one has to adapt it to the, the, the local environment to some extent. I think culture is terribly important. You know, when you, when you go as a consultant to an organisation, within 10 minutes you've got some serious strong indication of the culture, of formality, of time consciousness, of security issues. And sometimes the cultures don't adapt as fast as the environment around them. And that's one of the problems for executives. You know, one of the things I've always said, when you, uh, if you go in to an organization and want to know about the corporate culture, you must speak to people who have been there less than six months because they are still aware of it. Yeah. The ones who have been there the whole time think it's normal, think it's natural, and it isn't. And changing the culture, which is often what an executive is asked to do, is enormously problematic. You know, they'd say to me, can we change the culture by Christmas? And I'd always say, well, which Christmas? It's not that simple. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of um, uh, attempts at ensuring that people behave in particular ways. The definition of culture is the way we do things around here. It's our normal behaviours, normal in the sense of done every day. And you can change them. You can change them over time. And, my God, some executives have to. And should that be something which is, um, again seem to try and match someone's natural inclination towards mm. a cultural fit or do you think it, it's it's reasonable at the c-suite level to expect people to be able to modify their own cultural expectations to align with corporate mm. that's a difficult one um you know you you often hiring people for their slight quirkiness yep. for them doing things in a slightly odd way 
and which will have consequences. I think there is there are ways that one could describe cultures as being healthier and normaler than others, and I think there will be individuals who don't fulfil those criteria. Don't you know? It's do as I say, not as I do, and that's always a problem for for management. I think inevitably leaders have to model the behaviours they want, and if they don't model the behaviours they want, there will be consequences. So, Adrian, uh, it's been fascinating talking to you, by the way, and thank you for, for giving me some time. If I can be so bold as to put words in your mouth, but if I hear what you're saying, as you're really saying that, that leaders obviously are important, but the expectations placed upon them have increased exponentially. Indeed. And therefore, uh, as, as, the, as the demands on the C-suite and the demands of leaders increase, we have to be a lot more rigorous in terms of how they're selected. Indeed. And it can't just be... A, a, a one-off snapshot and we should look at multiple lenses and that is things such as you know cognitive abilities the emotional abilities as well as their capabilities that they have and then their potential to do more yes uh, and then sort of overlaying that if you like with some of the more intangible attributes which need to be measured such as their ability for competition yes. conscientiousness you know their ability to deal with ambiguity things things of that ilk um, so I mean so key takeaways would be that you need to have some form of quantitative measurement to have defensible decision making you need to have this idea that psychological characteristics can overlay work competencies and skill sets and really the, for me I thought the most interesting one was that in the modern workplace that this sense of, of agility and moving pathways from, from literally from, from the newest hires up would suggest that selection planning should almost be a continuous process of investment in, in developing existing future leaders right the way through the line as opposed to just a, a brief moment in time that, and you can probably never plan enough. I think you've made a perfect summary of what I've said. Adrian Fernand, thank you very much indeed.